Hey folks, so today I want to talk about what happens at plate boundaries. I'm going to put that as our title. This question often comes up in exam questions, often at the start of paper one. And I can't promise you what plate boundary it will be about. Sometimes it's more than one. But there are three that you need to be totally clued up on. So in fact, what would be great is if you could just divide your page roughly into three, like so. Okay, just leaving a little bit of room there for the titles. Okay, so in order, one, two, and three, you need to be prepared to know what happens at a destructive plate boundary. a constructive and a conservative. Okay, those are your three. Now what I'll do today, just very quickly, is I'll go through your case studies for them and briefly what happens at each one. But I'm going to draw something first of all, if you imagine that this box, okay, it's just separate. All plate boundaries move for the same reasons. Okay, if you remember from the work we've done in the classroom, you know that the core of the earth is 5,500 degrees. And you know that the mantle layer, the thickest layer, has um, lots and lots of magma inside it and convection currents, which are driven by the core of the earth. So I'm just gonna draw a semicircle. So not the best one, but there we go. Um, all right, with, imagine this is the core, and I know that's not technically accurate because you've got the inner and outer, but inside the core, you've got these convection currents, and they move in different ways. But essentially, it's heat rising, cooling, and falling back down. Okay. We're just going to go around like this. And they are huge, huge engines that the plates, which sit on the surface, the crust of the earth, sit on. And obviously they're all different shapes and sizes, so it's hard to, to show that accurately. But these convection currents are the reason that the plates move in the first place. So for instance here, we've got two big convection currents moving past each other, like a wet, sorry, away from each other. So here we have a constructive plate boundary. It happens to be the one that we're looking at anyway, but a constructive plate boundary. And this here might well be Iceland, where the plates are moving apart and Iceland is growing. It's getting bigger, for example. Um, and there are others, what construct, conservative ones, where perhaps the two plates are moving in the same direction, but one is moving slightly faster than the other. So that would be a conservative plate boundary, perhaps something like San Andreas. And I haven't got the best idea here, but if there was, for instance, another current coming this way, then this could be a destructive plate boundary, perhaps our Chile example where we've got the Nazca plate going under the South American plate. But any question, any question at all that you get about plate boundaries, always, always begin with convection currents. And how they cause the plates to move. Okay, that is your beginning point. Once you've established that, then you can go into detail about the three different types of plate boundary movement. Okay, so how I'm going to do this is with arrows. How we do it in the classroom is with a dance <laughs> but, um, and using diagrams and things. But for me, very simply, I'm just going to use arrows. Okay, and then we'll label them. So we've got our destructive, our constructive and our conservative. Now this is the only slightly odd one because they can either be traveling in the same direction, slightly different speeds, or they can sometimes be traveling 
in opposite directions. Okay, so if you just pop the arrows in. Now you would be expected for top, top marks to know the names of the plate boundaries for your case studies. So I'm gonna help you with that. Okay, so for destructive, your case study is Chile. And Chile, as we know, is a country in South America and it suffers from really big earthquakes. And that's because you've got two plate boundaries. Oh, sorry, one plate boundary and two plates. On the left, you've got the Nazca plate, which it happens to be um, an oceanic plate, which means it's, it's basically um, denser. It's made of basalt, uh, has the ocean on top of it. And then on the right, you've got the South American plate. And that, as we know, has a continent on it, doesn't it? It's, the, it's a continental plate. Continental. Uh, it's lighter, essentially. Now, when the two clash, it's the Nazca plate, the, the heavier oceanic plate, which actually subducts, it sinks underneath um, the South American plate. American plate, there we go. So you get this kind of subduction zone. So let's put this in order. So we know that convection currents cause the plates to move. But what we need to remember is the dense, and that basically means heavier, oceanic plate. Don't forget that word subducts, subducts, which basically means goes under. Okay, under the continental plate. So what happens at this plate boundary when that's going on? Well, <clears throat> that is a huge movement to be taking place. So the friction that that causes makes very strong earthquakes. Um, and that sinking plate it actually goes from rock to magma and then it gets very because it's containing lots of gas and things and it goes back to the surface as a volcano that erupts really violently so we need to get that in the dense oceanic plate subducts under the continental plate and it causes really strong earthquakes and volcanoes okay and that's quite a violent uh, eruption okay big earthquakes big volcanoes all right now let's move on constructive now hopefully if you came to iceland with me you will remember that iceland sits on a plate boundary called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now, if you didn't come with me to Iceland, you should hopefully remember that anyway, because that's been our case study. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it runs right through the North Atlantic and really bad drawing of Iceland, but let's just imagine that this is Iceland, okay, which is a relatively new island on Earth. And what we've got is on the right-hand side, we have the Eurasian Plate, which is the one that we sit on, okay, covers most of Europe. And then on the left, we've got the North American plate. And they meet, amazingly, in Iceland. And where they meet, they are pulling apart by about four centimetres per year. Now, this is great for Iceland. It means that Iceland's growing. And... It's not good for Iceland in other ways because these the friction of this plate boundary and being on this plate boundary does cause earthquakes and volcanoes. Okay, and we know that one of our case studies was the big, big eruption in 2010, uh, which actually cost billions in lost revenue all over Europe from flights being cancelled. So again, what happens here? Well, our starting point convection currents cause the plates to move. Then the two plates move apart.
And then in the gap, what happens is very fast moving magma breaks through and it breaks through that crust and it forms shield volcanoes. Now, if you remember, shield volcanoes are the sort of flatter ones, they're less cone shaped. Um, and that's because the, the lava's running so fast. So we want to put in there fast flowing magma breaks through. And then it forms shield volcanoes. Now instead of a normal cone-shaped one, they're just sort of like this. Okay. Now this obvious action, it, you know, it's making volcanoes. That friction as well is also causing earthquakes, but they are milder. Okay, so we need to put that in. Uh, earthquakes also occur, and then in brackets, although milder. Okay, there we go. So we've got our constructive plate boundary. Now, moving on to conservative. Now, your case study for this one sort of the wrong way around but it's it's the san andreas fault if you imagine the west coast of um america it's moving in that sort of northwest direction so we'll just put that in there san andreas another one that you can use for this that would be your high income country um is haiti in the caribbean that would be your low income country Okay, if you wanted to think about two different case studies. Now the really amazing thing about conservative ones is that there are no volcanoes. So we want to put this in bold. Earthquakes only. And the reason that there's only earthquakes is because there's no magma. It's two continental plates sliding past each other. There is no magma, it's just friction. Now the way that this happens, remember, starts with convection currents causing the plates to move and then what happens is they get stuck. Okay? They get stuck. And they get stuck because the plates are moving at different speeds. And all they need is you know, down there in the fault line is some jagged rock, you know, to get stuck on and pressure builds up, okay? And that pressure can build up for 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, but eventually those sticking points where they were stuck, they will break and then the plate will move and when it moves, that is the earthquake, that is the seismic energy. So we need to put, they get stuck, plates are moving at different speeds, friction builds up, friction builds, and then what happens is those snagging points break. I can't think of a better way to put that, but if you remember, I showed you um, Professor Ian Stewart's video on YouTube about how an earthquake forms. It is those snagging points, those rough points in the fault line that have held the plate back. Once they break, that's it. Then you've got an earthquake. Now these can be quite violent and quite sudden. No volcanoes. Okay. So there you have it. Your case studies, your um, different processes, but remember it always, always starts with those convection currents. The heat in the magma causing it to rise and then cooling down and then falling back down. And it's just a constant, constant dynamic process. So I hope that helps you.
with paper one.